After the belt of truth, I want to move on to the next item, which is the breastplate of righteousness. I want to go through quite a few, few scriptures, so we'll see what, uh, what we can learn from this. The breastplate of righteousness is, um, well, as it says, a breastplate. It covers the heart, it covers the lungs, the, the bowels, the vital organs uh, in the torso. And um, that's actually, in a way, you could say the most vulnerable of the warrior. It's the largest surface that, um, that you, you face when you have someone opposite you, so it's the easiest to hit. Now, for a Roman soldier in those days, it was all about two things, the heart and the bowel. That were the two things they, they were concerned about. In their belief system, which was, by the way, a pagan belief system, of course, but in their belief system, the heart was uh, covering the thoughts and the bowels were covering the emotions. And it's not so strange uh, when, uh, when someone is in love, we say they, he or she has butterflies in the stomach. We, you feel this in this area. Or when you're very nervous for an examination or something else, um, you might not feel so well uh, in your stomach or in, in your bowels. And some people even have to throw up and all this. So emotions are indeed uh, working on, on, uh, on your intestines. So it's not a strange thought that they came to this. So it's actually the thoughts, which is attached to the heart, and the emotions, which are attached to the bowels, that are protected by the breastplate. This is the belief system of the Roman soldiers. And Paul uses this because the breastplate of righteousness protects our thoughts and our emotions from attacks of the enemy. So that's the thought behind it. And of course we spoke a while ago on a Sunday uh, extensively uh, about the heart, that everything begins there, the, the good and the bad. And um, I want to go to Proverbs 4, verse 24, verse 23, sorry, which, uh, which states this. Proverbs 4, verse 23. It says there, keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. So keep your heart or protect your heart with diligence. All the issues of life are from the heart. It doesn't necessarily say here the good or the bad issues because both are actually. Yeah, we have seen um, naturally the natural man, uh, the heart of the natural man is wicked. Uh, and God has to replace that heart. Yeah, as it says several places in scripture, I will give you a new heart. Yeah, it's a matter of the heart. So keep the heart with diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The breastplate protects the heart. Now it's called the breastplate of righteousness. So the question is, how is righteousness attached to this? What does it have to do with it? And that we find also here in Proverbs, but in chapter 11, verse 4. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. So the second half is um, important here. Righteousness delivers from death. So without righteousness, there is death in the day of wrath. So when the breastplate um, 
when it's a breastplate of righteousness, it's, it protects against death. Uh, so now the next question is, what is righteousness actually? What is it? Because it's, it's a beautiful word and we use it a lot and it's, it's used many times in the Bible. But what, what does it mean? What does it, especially what does it mean in the biblical context, of course? It has the word right in there, and um, simply put, it means to live right, to live the right way, uh, which means to, be, to have integrity, to display holiness uh, <clears throat> and, and purity. Basically, these things are adopting the character of Jesus. That is what it is in the Christian from a Christian perspective, adopting the character of Jesus. And um, if we look at him as the example, he overcame all the temptations that, that crossed his path because of his righteousness. Uh, you, could, you could say because he was right in every sense. He was perfect. So this is what we ought to copy which we can never do on our own merit. We can only do it um, with the power of the Holy Spirit. It can only come from God and not from us. No way. Um, there is um, a verse that, uh, that shows this. Uh, Isaiah 59, verse 16 and 17. And we will read another uh, part of this same chapter here again. But it's, <clears throat> it's talking um, about... Uh, the need for, for justice, the need for redemption, the need for an intercessor. It's really showing that there is a need for Jesus. And you find here in verse 16, And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. And now you see where Paul was thinking of when he spoke this, uh, or wrote these words in the letter to Ephesians. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. So this, you could say, is the Old Testament version of Ephesians uh, 6. Description of the whole armor of God. Righteousness as a breastplate. And here we see also, it's not Paul's invention, it is God's invention. This is God speaking. And so, through the Holy Spirit, um, God put these words again in, uh, in Paul's mind. And he uh, wrote them down in this letter to the Ephesians. But we see here it is God. He put on this righteousness. He provides this. We cannot produce it. And we will see a few more verses that clearly show this. So that's where righteousness comes from. Now what is righteousness? Um, and there are, of course, you can say many things about it. But we're going to divide it into three types of righteousness. Three types of righteousness that we can uh, distinguish. And the first one is the righteousness of faith. Righteousness of faith. And this, this comes when a sinner accepts his sinful nature and accepts the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, as redemption for his or her sins. And then is justified through Jesus. At that moment, this person is righteous before God. Without the salvation, without the blood of Jesus, we are not righteous before God at all. We cannot come before God, but through salvation and faith, actually because of that we submit in obedience to the Lord. Through that, God can see us righteous. That's righteousness through faith. And uh, we can read this in Romans 5, the first two verses. And uh, I'm sorry that we go through many verses, but we'll, you see that it is, the Bible is very consistent and very solid 
in, in what it teaches about righteousness. And it's also very important because, as we will also see, righteousness is one of the characteristics of God himself. He is actually righteousness. And it manif it's manifested through Jesus. So when we understand deeper what righteousness is, we also understand better this specific characteristic of God. So it's an important thing. Romans 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So it, it declares here, we are justified by faith. We have to believe with our hearts, profess with our mouths. But it's by faith. And then, through Jesus Christ, through the grace, that we, uh, we are justified. And we have peace with God. By nature we are enemies of God. And through Jesus Christ we have peace with God. And God can actually look upon us and, and uh, uh, love us the way he wants to. So, this is called righteousness of faith. Now, you might think, and many actually do, that's it. Once I've, I've uh, accepted this, my salvation, now I'm righteous, now everything's fine, and uh, I can move on with my life. Uh, that would be um, easy, but it's not the way it is. There is then the next step of righteousness, and that is called righteousness through sanctification. Righteousness through sanctification. And maybe you remember from the, the picture of the tabernacle, because we see exactly these steps. Um, first, it is the, the um, altar of burnt offering, which is a picture of the cross. This is the, the, uh, the uh, redemption of the sins. That you could say there is righteousness of faith. But then you move on towards the tabernacle. And the next thing is the laver, where you wash your hands and feet. Which is, of course, a picture of the Spirit and of the Word and even of baptism. That sanctifies you. It makes you holy. It separates you. And now you can enter the tabernacle. And now you're separated from the world. So righteousness through sanctification, that's actually the next step. And it's also a continuous step. That it's every day. Most of our life, we are, we are dealing with that, with this becoming more holy, more sanctified, more separate, more conformed or transformed, I should say, in the image of God. And we have to um, point our, our will and our moral compass towards what God says in his word. That's why we have to have the belt of truth, because we have to know what's in the word. Otherwise, we're not able to do so. But we have to, um, to focus on that, and um, that, is, that is difficult. It's not an easy thing. And uh, Jesus gives uh, actually uh, well, many, but I want to point out three things that he gives um, that should give us an idea what this is about. And in, in Luke 14, verse 26, 28, he says that we have to take up and bear our cross. We have to take up and bear our cross, which means it's not easy. And of course, when he said these words, the listeners would not know that he would actually literally be carrying his cross through the streets of Jerusalem, uh, showing there uh, what it means to really give your life and bear your cross. So it's not an easy thing. We have to be ready to sacrifice, um, and to, to mortify the flesh completely. And then in uh, Matthew 7, verse 14, he says it's a narrow road. It's not a highway, it's a narrow road. So again, it shows it's not the easy path that everybody takes. It's a narrow road, and he even says that there will only be a few who will be able to pursue it until the end. Only a few will find this narrow gate. 
And then in Matthew 24, verse 13, he says, he who endures until the end will be saved. And that is a beautiful promise, of course. That's encouragement. So it's often difficult. It's not always difficult, by the way. On, along the way, there are many blessings and there is lots of joy. Even, even in the misery, there is often joy in the heart. So um, it's not only uh, bad or difficult, but um, we should also not expect that it's an easy thing. But he who endures until the end will be saved. So the, the receiving of uh, righteousness through faith at salvation is one thing, but, but pursuing this continuous uh, righteousness through sanctification, that's a daily process that goes on every day. And we fall, we stumble and we fall. We have to get on our knees, repent, and get up on our feet and we continue. That, that's um, a part of our growth. Um, and many, unfortunately most, won't make it. That is very uh, sobering, but that's the reality. From all those that left Egypt, it was only Caleb and Joshua who entered the promised land, who kept their faith. They kept their faith. And it's not that they kept their faith 40 years. They kept their faith the, the short period of time when they first reached the land. Because when they were there, and the explorers talked about the giants, the others were already giving up. That was the 40 years at the beginning, actually. So um, that shows that most most of us give up very easily, even before it really begins. So um, this is really something to pay attention to. So this breastplate, it covers the, the largest part of, of the body. Um, and it's really because it's very important. It's, it, it, we are vulnerable in this whole area. So that's the second um, type of righteousness. And the third type is a very, very uh, dangerous one. That's, uh, we could call it social righteousness. That is the righteousness we display to others around us. That is our, our hunger to be righteous towards our neighbors. And that is an instruction that we should do so. Um, for this I want to read a few verses. First of Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So this is an instruction from Jesus. He says, let your light shine before men. This is in general men. Uh, so that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So this is not, this is not just to show how good you are. It's first of all to glorify God. And in the light, of course, he speaks about is the light of the gospel, the light that um, is, is uh, fueled by the Holy Spirit. But uh, I, as I said, this type of righteousness is dangerous because many, uh, many Christians forget the other two and stick only with this. They do good things. They show that they are good people and that they have love and all this. And... They think that's okay. It's not. <laughs> the other two are actually more important. And they, they have to be first. Then this is the result. This actually um, this, uh, is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you see Galatians 5.22, the first thing that's mentioned there is love. There is one big difference between um, earthly love and love that comes from the Holy Spirit. Earthly love, you have to set yourself to, to do it. You decide on your own to do it. Love that comes as a result of the Holy Spirit, you cannot deny it. You have to do it, whether you want it or not. It just comes. So, and that's with every, every characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit. It becomes your nature, and so you, you do it, whether you want it or not. It, it's... it's uh, it's pushed. Um, Galatians 6, verse 9 and 10 also speak of this. 
And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Don't grow tired of, do, of doing good. But again, you have to see it from, as a result of the Holy Spirit that works in you. So he says then in verse 10, if there's an opportunity, seize it. Don't let it pass, this opportunity. Seize it. Unto all men, it's the same what Jesus said, unto men. It's not making, uh, uh, not discriminating anything, anyone. But he says here, uh, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. If you cannot even do it in your own household, eh, among your own brothers, then it would be uh, hypocritical to do it unto others. <coughs> and actually, it's a sign that it's not real. Um, a similar uh, verse to this we find also in the Old Testament in Proverbs 3, verse 27, 28. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the, in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, Go, and come again, and tomorrow I will give, when thou hast it by thee. So it's saying the same thing. When you can do good at that moment, do it. When there's the opportunity, use the opportunity. It's not there for nothing. It's there to seize it. And so, by the way, from this, and also what we read before from Isaiah, you can see, of course, there are many more examples that, Paul was wearing the belt of truth. He was speaking continuously from the word. He was not making up things. As sometimes you, you read these critics that Paul made, made the gospel and created all kinds of doctrines. No, he was always speaking in the spirit of the word. And um, It's beautiful to see because that is, that is also um, yeah, something we can learn from when we speak with others or even uh, in our own thoughts that it has to be based and rooted in the word and it can only be if we read it it can only be if we read it so all this righteousness that we speak this social rights righteousness is also the, the third one it, and it has to be the third one because it has to begin with this righteousness of faith and then the righteousness through sanctification and then this will be an automatic result actually it's, a, it's part of the fruit, so you cannot uh, deny it. Uh, but again, uh, yeah, many uh, skip the first two and try to do it on their own, try to do good works. And that's the danger, of course. And if you take only these verses, you can even defend this, uh, this doctrine. But it's wrong. We are unable, on our own, to do, to, to, to display righteousness. And uh, I want to also read a few verses about that because that has to be very clear. In Psalm 14, verse 1, God said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that do it good. So if you, whatever you do, it might seem as good as can be, but uh, if it is without it's not based on God, then it's ab even abominable works, it's called here. And, and, and it says, and none, there is none that doeth good, none. There's no exceptions to that. Um, Romans 3, verse 10 says um, basically the same. Again, it's Paul, he knows what he's speaking about, because he begins here, he says, as it is written, and indeed it is written, we just read it, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So it's basically repeating here what we just read from Psalm 14, but he uses here this word righteous. None is righteous, not one. That is our state. And, and finally on this, in Isaiah 40. So, sorry, 64 verse 6, um, it is said very bluntly, but it cannot be more clear. 
But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That is, if it's only, if it's, it comes from our heart. And again, it uses the same word here, righteousnesses. That is our state. So we have to have first righteousness of faith. That's where it begins. Otherwise, it's uh, like it says here. And why is it so? Because you might think, yes, but people can do good things. Why not? Even if they don't believe in God, they can do good things. Why are the, those works abominable? Uh, the reason is because the motive is wrong. And the motive is, is always pride and selfishness. And this we can find in uh, Titus. Verse, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So it's disobedience. It's not in obedience to God. It's just whatever their heart uh, tells them to do. Wrong motives and it's abominable. Also what it says in Psalm 14, verse 1 that we read. So this, the, the social right, righteousness, the last of these three that I mentioned, um, should not be confused with this righteousness of men, which is actually filthy rags. It's abominable works. Uh, it has to be uh, together with the other two forms. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's not uh, real. So righteousness, as I said, it's part of the, the character of God. Actually, God is righteousness. And so I want to read uh, a few verses that show this righteousness of God, this, this characteristic of God that actually we, we uh, ought to strive after. That's the righteousness through sanctification we try to we try, we are being transformed to the image um, that Jesus said before us. And so we can see from scripture what, what this righteousness is that God displays. And uh, Psalms, uh, we find uh, several good examples. Um, for Psalm 97, verse 2. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Righteousness and judgment. That is part of the character of God. And we see it again in Psalm 119, verse 142. There it says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. God does never waver, never faint, consistent. And in the same psalm, verse 172, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. This is a very interesting verse. All thy commandments are righteousness. So the commandments of God are righteousness. That will link it to obedience because you have to obey God's commandments. Uh, and actually, if if things are correct, you want to obey God's commandments, and but they are righteousness. So that is uh, that is perfect. How does this manifest itself through Jesus? So the righteousness of God of which the Old Testament speaks, we read now a few verses, is manifested through Jesus. And of course, we, we, we saw already, eh, the righteousness of faith comes by grace, but it's faith in Jesus. It's a salvation that he provides. So, if, for example, from Romans 3, verse 21 through 24, 
this is explained. And in these chapters, Paul is putting the law and the gospel next to each other. He's making there a point that the law cannot save. And here he uh, addresses righteousness. Uh, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. The next two verses have, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So this is, this is the righteousness of faith that we spoke about. Eh? Um, it says literally here, it is by faith of Jesus Christ and to all that believe. And that manifests the righteousness of God without the law. It's without the law manifested. The law is truth. We read the, from Psalm 119. Uh, the law is truth, but... Um, the righteousness, it does not need the law. The righteousness is manifested through Jesus. And, and this uh, shows again that we cannot be appear righteous before God without Jesus. It's impossible. In uh, Romans uh, chapter 6, verse 16 through 18, Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, then uh, you became the servants of righteousness. This is Romans 6, verse 16 through 18. So here you have on, on the balance, on one side you have sin that leads to death and on the other side you have obedience unto righteousness. So obeying God uh, leads to righteousness. Disobeying God leads to death. These are the only two directions. And of course then in together with what we read before, that this righteousness can only come through Jesus, makes the whole picture complete. Uh, he says here in verse 17, you have obeyed from the heart, so here it's from the heart again, uh, that, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So you have obeyed and, and gave, given heed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of salvation. And that made you free from sin. And then you became servants of righteousness. So we begin to see that the righteousness that is of our nature is actually filthy rags. It's, it's abominable. It should not even be called righteousness. Um, the righteousness of God is pure. It's everlasting. And we can only um, come in that light through Jesus. That's the righteousness of faith. Uh, your favorite verse, Galatians 2, verse 20 and 21. It's a declaration of, of faith. It's a testimony here. It's beautiful words. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law. Then Christ is dead in vain. The last part. He says if righteousness come by the law. Then Christ would have died in vain. In other words righteousness comes through Christ. That's why he died. And so this is again an explanation of what he wrote before. And what we just read from the letter in the, to the Romans. By grace, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. These are really sentences you have to read three or four times and think about what does it actually say. And it, 
it's, uh, it's very deep. But it's again righteousness, and it comes through Christ. Paul, again, he says here, if it came by the law, then he died in vain. He puts again the law and the gospel on two sides of the balance. He does not, by the way, uh, say that the law is, is, can be thrown away, but he, he says uh, all the time, the law cannot save you. We, this is the message to the Jews there, the law cannot save you. And they were so uh, hung to this law, to the letter of the law, and uh, they were not living the spirit of the law. Uh, finally, in this, uh, from Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, and these are all verses you've probably read many times, but now you see this word righteousness all the time pop up from it. And you see how often this is actually used. And, and that shows how important the breastplate of righteousness is. So here it says, Yeah, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do not count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made comfortable unto his death. Again, a very powerful testimony, but he says again, it's not, and don't have my own righteousness, which is of the law, and from which we know, we've read it now, that's, that's abominable works, that's filthy wrecks, that's nothing. No, uh, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So that's the righteousness of faith, the first of the three that we mentioned. That is what he declares here. So if you take the word righteousness, it starts with right. And you, you become right because Jesus makes you right. You're wrong and he makes you right. And that's a simple uh, explanation in simple words. But that's what it's about. Now the word righteousness is used uh, more than 300 times throughout scripture. So we could find many more uh, verses. But I think the point is clear. So to be righteous is to do right in the eyes of God, obey his commandments, which are righteousness, as we read. So obedience is a very important part of it. While at the same time adapting this, this nature of Jesus, following his example. So God's word, God's commandments are righteousness. God's character is righteousness. The opposite, sin, is lawlessness. So if you say God's commandments, in Hebrew that would be Torah, commandment, which is also word or instruction, uh, lawlessness is Torahlessness. It's, law is also Torah. Okay? So if God's commandments are righteous, then sin, lawlessness, is the opposite. The opposite of righteousness is sin. Which means... If we sin, we throw away our breastplate. And we are unprotected in this area. And the breastplate is not held by the, by the belt. It's, it's a really separate item. We can lose it. We're still wearing the belt of truth. But we can lose it when we sin. We, we, when, as soon as we sin, we, we, we throw away part of our, our protection against the enemy. As we, if we sin, our heart and our emotions are now vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. And he will attack right away because he's waiting for these moments, of course. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back to Isaiah 59, from which we read before. And um, maybe if you read it later at home, uh, you read the whole chapter because it's a very... Um, Beautiful chapter and fits very well in the whole context here. But I want to read verse 1 and 2 now. 
verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. So it's, we know this, of course, very basic, but our, our sins separate us from God. It's our, so as soon as we sin, there, there's no, um, um, no presence of the righteousness, uh, the righteousness through sanctification. That's what we throw away. It's the second part. So, but we lose the breastplate. We're very vulnerable at that moment. And thus we need to get it back right away, repent. When we, so when we are righteous, when, when we do not sin, yeah, when we, we strive to, after this sanctification, this holiness, then the enemy cannot touch us. He cannot reach our heart. He, can, he has no, no authority, no, uh, no, no legal right actually to go there because we are righteous. We are protected by this breastplate of righteousness. Now, Paul uh, gives um, two other characteristics that he links to this breastplate. So, he speaks about righteousness, but in 1 Thessalonians, uh, he gives two other uh, characteristics that he attaches to the breastplate, because he mentions it uh, also there. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. And in this chapter, we read a lot from when we speak about um, the rapture. The day of the Lord, and um, it is in that context that he also says, put on the breastplate. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. He may, he, again, he uses here this armor as a picture, but here he says the breastplate of faith and love. So you might think, yeah, this is this is uh, this doesn't fit with what he he writes to the Ephesians. There is righteousness, and here it's faith and love. Um, these are different things, but actually they are they are linked. If we go to Gal Galatians five, verse six. So again, we have now faith and love as um, two characteristics. And here he writes, Galatians 5, verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So faith worketh by love. Faith and love are linked. And uh, you can then trace back, of course, uh, faith. Uh, through faith you will receive the Holy Spirit. Part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. And so this, these two are linked. So it, how is this now linked to righteousness? That we can find in Romans, chapter 4, verse 3, saith the scripture, Abram believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So he was not justified by works, but he believed God, he had faith. And that was counted unto him for righteousness. So faith and righteousness are linked. And actually we have said it already before, because the first type of righteousness was righteousness of faith. Faith and righteousness are linked, and faith and love are linked. So these three actually, they indeed go together. So these are, are other characteristics of this, this breastplate of righteousness. Faith and love. And you could, you could actually say, um, faith is necessary to get it. And love is the result if you sustain it. Because love is the social uh, righteousness. And social righteousness you can only express when you have righteousness through sanctification. After you received righteousness of faith. It's really a chain Actually, if you think of it, it's very makes very much sense. So it begins with faith, and it will result in, in love. 
And we saw already that this, um, this second type, this righteousness of sanctification or through sanctification, it's a daily process. So it's, it's, ne it's never a one-time event. One prayer, you're saved, and that's it. No, it's, it's a daily process, and as we saw, you can, um, you can lose the breastplate. If, if we sin, we lose the breastplate. And uh, then we cannot, um, we cannot uh, say to the enemy or, or even to God, yes, but before I had it, you're too bad, but now you lost it. Uh, this comes out very clear in um, Ezekiel 33, verse 13. When I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely live if he trusts his own, to his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousnesses shall not be remembered. But for his iniquity that he had committed, he shall die for it. We see you can hear the word righteousness, so the, the, the the righteous, speaking to the righteous, who commits iniquity, sin. Then, all his righteousnesses that he had, they shall not be remembered. He lost it. And for the iniquity, for the sin, he shall die. The wages of sin is death. So it's very serious business. It's, it's really like a soldier on the battlefield who, who loses his, his defense. And he's hit by the enemy and he dies. It's severe, it's serious. And so uh, we have to really take it serious. And we see the enemy takes it serious. The enemy is not joking when they, when they call people all around the world to go engage in, into a ritual. That's just not for fun. It's very serious stuff. So we also have to be serious about it. But on the, on the other hand, it makes also sense, because otherwise we could do very good yeah, when we are in the mood, and then we could, uh, we could lean on that uh, work that we had done before, and then it would actually be through, through works. And it can never be like that. So it's a continuous fight, and, and it's, it's not different in the, in the real world world battlefield, um, uh, or the physical world, I should say, because this is all, also real, even more real. But in the physical world, if, if uh, an army wins a fight, and the next day they're on the battlefield for the next fight, they cannot just be cool because they won yesterday. No, because they will de be defeated today. So they have to be on the edge every time. As long as the war goes on and the war will go on until the very end, yeah, um, as we read uh, or as I mentioned from Matthew 24 verse 13, uh, he who endures until the end will be saved. And um, that's what we have to keep in front of us. And Isaiah 32 verse 17 also gives this, uh, this promise. So this is at the end of the age, and the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Then the battle will be over. But we see here twice mentioned righteousness again. One thing I want to mention in the context of this is the breastplate of the high priest. We spoke, of course, a while ago about this priestly garment, and the high priest also had a breastplate. And um, this breastplate was uh, made out of five materials, which is the number of grace. And as we've read today, it comes uh, by grace, yeah, through faith, by grace. So that's what it, it also shows there. And this this breastplate of the, of the high priest, um, the, the koshen misfat, it's called, um, the breastplate of judgment, um, because of the stones that were there, it was used to, to uh, inquire God of any issue that they wanted to have an answer for, and then the, the judgment, the answer would come. So um, this breastplate is really determining life or death, it's judgment. Um, 
and it's it's and we can only get it by grace. We cannot uh, get it any other way. So uh, there you see the parallel there, and of course the, it's the, only the high priest that wears this, not the other priest. And the high priest is a picture of our eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. So it points to him, and it shows that it's it's only from him and through him, and there's no other way. And it's by grace. So, um, if we wear the breastplate of righteousness, we do something. We affirm Jesus Christ and his blood, and that through that we are saved by grace. That is what we affirm. And we affirm, as we read from Galatians 2, that the, the cross, yeah, that we have died with Christ, it's him who lives in us. That is what we, what we, the statement that we make with this breastplate. And this statement is extremely powerful spiritually. That defeats the enemy. There's no way he can penetrate that. That's the blood of Christ. That is the most powerful there is in the spiritual battle. So that's very important, very important. And at the same time, with it, we reject all the natural goodness and righteousness of the world and um, this, this what the Pope likes to call, uh, use so often this word, humility. All this that comes from man's heart, which as we read, it's abominable works, it's filthy rags, it's actually nothing. This is what we reject when we wear the breastplate of righteousness. We don't say that it's not good to care for your neighbor. Of course it is. But it has to come um, from God and not from the own heart. That selfishness, that's pride. And there's always a, another agenda. And the enemy will, is there. The enemy will use that vehicle for his purpose. So, how do we wear this? How do we do it? What is the action that you and I need to do in order to wear this breastplate of righteousness? That is, that we display the righteousness of Jesus. That's what we have to, to show. That is, that's many things, eh? integrity, but holiness most of all, the sanctification, holiness, and the purity. How does it come? Through obedience. We have to obey his word. We have to obey his word. So we have to wear the belt of truth. We have to know the word. If we don't know it, we can't obey it. So um, we can't live in the spirit of what it, it says. So uh, it, it's a logical next step. We have to obey and avoid sin. Because as soon as we sin, we lose it. And we're vulnerable. So, one of the things that we should do, yeah, continuously actually, is, is ask God to reveal our weaknesses and our, our sins, and then get rid of them with his uh, help. Don't compromise. And, yeah, pursue holiness. It's really, we ought to be priests, and we have to be clean before we enter the tabernacle. So, if, as we saw with the belt of truth, be engaged in the word of God on a daily basis. And with the breastplate of righteousness, uh, pursue holiness, sanctification. Also on a daily basis, <laughs> it's continuously. Amen. Mm -hmm.